started. I believe the mayor might be a little late and uh, Councilman Robinson may be a few minutes late as well. So we'll go ahead and get started with a discussion of the K-1 roof issues and options. Mr. Johnson. Yes, sir. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you, Council. Um, as you know, when uh, Thompson Watermark presented to y'all uh, the assessment of the K-1 Center, one of the discussions that we led into is one of the kind of the uh, issues as we're making decisions going forward is, is the, the leaking of the roof uh, and the water intrusion and the damage that has caused and would continue to cause. And y'all had asked to uh, come back to you with what are some options in the short term as well as, as long term. Um, and you have in your packet uh, what they put together, they kind of put out three options. Um, and they have uh, sent me an email with uh, even some further modification. I'll kind of go through that. Uh, is option one was a full replacement. And uh, just to kind of give you ballpark, uh, not knowing what structural repair would have to be done, that they think let, that cost. Let me stop you real, real yes, quick. I don't see anything in our package on oh. this. Oh, I, I, you have I anything? Would, yeah, I can. Uh, I will forward this email. I'm sorry. I thought that got moved forward with the agenda item. Um, and we're all looking at this. I'll give you that for your records, Mr. President. And uh, just to go through this, uh, they, they put together three options for y'all to consider. Um, and option three has an A and a B component. And I'll kind of cover that real quickly. But uh, Bottom line, a replacement cost, which is a new roof, uh, they think would be 200000 plus whatever structural repairs have to be made in the trusses and roof system. And they felt that they could do the complete engineering front and back on that for 11800 Then they came up with what they considered a just emergency repair. That is to identify, based upon previous site visits and some further, the areas that immediately need attention and direct that work and complete it. They came up with a, a construction cost of $20,000 for those repairs and the engineering design and oversight of $5,100. One of the things that they, they brought to me as at least to make you aware of, uh, when the hurricane that hit uh, uh, Mexico Beach last year uh, also did a great bit of damage to Tyndall Air Force Base and actually Thompson Watermark got the contract to deal with the envelope damage to the buildings on the Air Force Base there. But the problem was the, the, the military realized this may be an opportunity to further repurpose those buildings or determine a long-term use for them. They didn't want to have to make decisions that pin them down, so they asked for a, a, an option to secure the building from water intrusion, but not such to put a brand new roof on it until they decide what the future of those buildings were. And they came up with a welded HDPE membrane system that literally went over the whole top of the building, was pinned at the edges, and as they stated, gave complete water protection from the structure uh, as long as it was not punctured or damaged by people on top of the roof or anything of that nature. And uh, they said that as long as maintained, the, the, the attachments would, would keep the building dry for a long period of time. They estimate that that same type of program would be about 95000 in construction with the engineering of $4,500. Um, 95000 Yes, sir. Uh, probably, the and, and I'll just kind of read there. Uh, on option, they, they've redefined option as 3A, and I will forward this to you as well. This would be a membrane capping of the existing roof that would be pinned at the perimeters of the roof. The membrane sheeting would be lapped and closed at sheet abutments. Termination bars with sealant mastics would utilize as detailed areas. Pro, known high quality product utilized after catastrophic storm events, watertight as, an, as a new removed and replaced roof, less than half the cost of a replacement, large amount of time for council to plan for future of the building use. Con, possibility of tears and perimeter detachment during strong storm events or impact damage. Fairly short-term cost versus, uh, fairly short-term versus cost, no labor warranty, but does have a limited product warranty. And this is what they called option 3B. This would be a membrane capping of the existing roof. The membrane sheeting would be lapped and closed to self adheres to add sheet abutments. Termination bars with sealant mastic would be utilized at detailed areas. 
Pro good quality product utilized after catastrophic storm events and for excellent underlayment of new roofing. Watertight as a new removed and replaced roof less than the cost of 3A. Short amount of time for the council to plan for the future of the building's use. Uh, product would begin to break down due to UV exposure in the three to four month range listed as six month life but could possibly last a year. Con, short amount of time for the council to plan for the future of the building. Product would begin to break down due to UV exposure, three to four month range, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and he did not add a breakout of those prices, but I'll get that for you. But I, I, really what I want to talk to you about is, is which direction you want to go. I, I will tell you, in my opinion, option two is the direction I think would be the most economically feasible for us to just get in and address where the immediate leaks are get a repair patch job done and then buy enough time for y'all to decide where we're going in the future. Uh, a membrane at 95000 which is almost half the cost of a new roof, doesn't seem to be a good value to me. Richard, I've, I've talked to uh, uh, roof doctors in the past and they can put, uh, it's, a, it's a spray on like elastomeric coating and it comes with a 15 year uh, warranty on it. I, I, it's a one or two year on workmanship, but I think it's 15 years on material. I, I want to say that the city of Arrow used them recently somewhere to, to patch a roof, and uh, they are uh, very inexpensive. And uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't disagree with you. The ninety-five thousand dollars for um, now, I'm just to be very honest, especially over the center portion of that building, which you know, maybe completely remodeled, you know, in the near future, doesn't make sense to put a new roof on that. Now on the wings, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but we could still buy ourselves time. But this, uh, I would like to, to see what roof doctors could do. That The structural concerns need to be probably taken care of uh, soon, but I don't think that we have a lot of structural uh, defects, uh, according to that um, survey, that, that needs to be taken care of. And, and then I asked, do we, do we need, uh, do we need an engineer of record beyond what, what you could do yourself to make those structural repairs? Um, no, not necessarily. The, the, the biggest issue is, is, you know, between me and, and Lance, we could probably go and determine where the, the, where the worst areas are and, and consult with those that do it on a day-in, day-out business of what they recommend as repair and put together basically a scope of work and get it out on the street. Uh, I will just tell you, as far as Roof Doctor goes, they have been the, the leading winner of pricing for roof jobs for us lately. I believe that they, I know they did the Quell Creek Clubhouse just recently, and they, their price was far, for the same product, same materials, was far less than any other quotes. And I believe they also did the section of the PD. Uh, they, they came in low quote on that. So, But they do more than, you know, they do metal roofing, they do shingles, and they also do a spray a elastomeric coating, which would, would you know, would, would give us plenty of time to do do anything. It may be another low cost option. So if that hasn't been looked at, I, I would ask you, and with the council's permission, to ask you to, to explore that option as well. I've never seen that product used on a slope roof, but mm -hmm. I could be wrong. And I could be too. Yeah, it's flat roof. Right. Product. It is flat roof that I know of. The applications that I'm aware of are flat roof. On slope. But it, it, I think they can put it. Uh, I think they could put it on a slant roof. I think they can, you know, if we just have a few leaks, they, they might put it just over those immediate areas as well. I think it's looking into it. I'd say it's worth looking into it, no matter if they can or can't. They, that, they can tell us if they can. Right. So, you, so your option two. I think, I think the option one and three are definitely out. I mean, just with the cost. Well, the 200 and the 100, I mean, we don't know for sure what the design of that building is. May look like on the roof. The so option two was how much? They estimated the the, the actual construction cost of twenty thousand and the engineering design and oversight of fifty one hundred dollars. So a little bit over twenty five thousand. Yeah, I'd be in favor of option two or either two or the roof. Doctor. Two or you know, and then look at that one more option. And we, we we got time. I mean, it could be that if you got numbers, you could send it to everybody and. You know, and ask the individual council members what you know what they think. Uh, it may not be it may not be an option. I may be dreaming here. Well, and I think you know I, I have no fear. Of, you know, the good news is as part of their assessment, they gave us a roof plan, so we we have that information. Uh, we have at least generalized locations of where the water damage was observed. As we all know, with roof leaks, sometimes where the damage is is not exactly where the leak is, uh, but. Uh, 
you know, we can put together a scope of work, put it out there to the roof companies and, and get them to bring us back a proposal of what they think they, they can do to, to fix in a short-term emergency type repair situation those leaks and uh, bring that back to you and there'd be no cost of getting that question answered. So what I'd ask you to do is if you could give us just a little, maybe if we got a little bit more information uh, so that by the next meeting we could come in here to the work session and, and have maybe a resolution prepared to adopt that. So in, in other words we're not kicking it down the road for another okay. month but maybe in two weeks have a have an answer and get something passed. Does that sound reasonable council? I think we can get that put together and get that out there. Because mm -hmm. okay. it wasn't going to go on tonight anyway. So no, sir. It'll yes. go on next agenda, hopefully, irregardless of what what options we have, and then we can we can vote. Great. Your name. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. I have a direction. All right. All right, Miss Walker. You got Brandon with you. Yeah, Brandon. Oh, that's Brandon. Yes. Yes, sir. How are you doing? You let him in here? <laughs> I did. I did. He even brought y'all a packet. Yeah, I've got this some information awesome. for you guys. Uh, to, we'll, we'll just kind of go through it briefly. I don't want to take up too much of your time. I know you guys have more important things to deal with. Um, but uh, so yes, uh, my name is Brandon Gertz, and I'm the location manager for a feature film that is for Amazon Prime. It's going to be an Amazon Prime original, um, and it's being uh, produced by Film Nation. And essentially, the story uh, focuses on uh, a heartfelt love story between two teenagers that are caught in a repeating day scenario kind of like the movie Groundhog's Day where they constantly re-experience the same day over and over again and the boy the main character Mark is having a great time he's helping his family he's helping out people in the town he's going around and solving problems he's enjoying making a perfect day out of that opportunity and he meets a girl who's experiencing the same thing and she is not having quite the same experience. She's kind of bummed out, she's down and out, but reliving that same day over and over again. And essentially, he tries to start show her these little perfect moments around the town where something happens at the right place at the right time. A bus pulls behind a gentleman and gives him angel's wings. They go and see a, a hawk take a fish out of the water at this majestic lake. It's just these perfect moments across the town. And from there, they start to enjoy finding all these little perfect moments. They go around the town and make a map. Every day, they redraw the map and, and kind of are trying to figure out why they're stuck in this repeating day and then try to use that as a, a sort of a puzzle to figure out, to find their way out of uh, their predicament. And so, uh, like I said, it's for Amazon Prime, and it was at one point uh, going to be a Disney film um, in production, but they, they did not want to continue producing that one and now Amazon's taking it over so that's the the type of story it is it's a it's a heartfelt love story essentially and and so basically I wanted to lay out kind of everything that we've been talking about uh, I've, I've been working with Jessica for over the last the fish, couple the do I said for everybody but the fish by the way <laughs> yeah the fish didn't, didn't, so didn't land it too Brandon well. reached out to me in November about this because it's pretty uh pretty fair hope heavy if you'll you'll be able to see as we go through. We wanted to make sure that um, that during Fairhope's busiest season, which is, you know, Mardi Gras and Arts and Crafts, that we were able to work with them and, and make sure that you guys knew what they were doing. So Brandon put together these packets for you, yeah. uh, which is something I don't know that we've ever seen from a film before, so it's pretty incredible. And so basically the location breakdown after the table of contest shows uh, highlighted in green some of the places that are predominantly where we feel like would be in Fairhope or could be, I think could potentially be in Fairhope. Um, we're still in the selection process of a couple of different things. And then I took a couple of different photos um, from the director of photography for certain areas that they, we've been looking at. Uh, obviously, the Fairhope Pharmacy. There's Fairhope High School hallway down there um, on the second page. Um, an, an area of Section Street that they would like to do kind of a Fred Astaire dance through the streets as they dodge some of the pedestrians and, and other vehicles and things. Uh, there's a picture there of the public works area where there's a scene where they, they um, pick up an excavator and use it to save a kitten from a tree um, and then the interior of Fairhope Pharmacy and then out there on the streets but but just wanted to show a little bit there and then pass the permit and uh, there's a breakdown of what these Fairhope locations are looking or shaping up to look like um, 
Fairhope High School uh, would be a portion of a day and uh, a couple of scenes at the Coastal Community College as well. Um, the Fairhope Animal Clinic is one of their top choices for what would be an animal shelter and a vet, um, a scene in there where the gentleman is trying to track down somebody who's lost their dog um, and he goes to basically several different places where people would be with animals. Um, the hospital, we're looking at Thomas Infirmary just for the interior work on, on the third floor uh, to not do more of our exterior work there because of the impact there. We're, uh, I've shown them Thomas Medical Center up in Daphne, which has a lot more closed hours and a lot more feasible of a, of a place for us to conduct our exterior filming there without causing an impact to the hospital here. Uh, Public Works, uh, there's a mansion that we've been looking at, a couple of different options that I think won't necessarily be within city limits, uh, but maybe some of the supporting sites or uh, in general, I just wanted you guys to know that that might be a possibility. But um, the back door to walk by the bay is a place that we're looking to use as a, as a, a, a connecting point as they travel through uh, a walkabout from, they actually travel out of that diner, which is supposed to be coming out the back door of Book Inn. So they leave the Book Inn, they come out of the walk by the bay, and then they go and continue on to a restaurant and, and down the street. Um, Fairhope Library, the exterior is a focus, um, an, an opening scene, and the interior is something we would be looking to film at. A uh, Vernon's Barber Shop. We did find a house for Margaret's um, in the Fruit and Nut District that I showed them this morning that they are uh, showing interest in, so that, that, that may be an area where we um, film Margaret's house. Um, and then there's, towards the latter part of our shoot, we've set up uh, some things for the downtown area, which would be pretty heavily involved in, a, in a, um, a, uh, something that would be kind of a, uh, more of an impact uh, to the downtown area than has been for films in the recent past, um, in, probably in the last six or seven years, I would believe. Um, but something that I'm putting a lot of focus into in a lot of conversations with the business owners and with the streets department to try to make uh, an effective plan so that we can execute the filming um, and that everybody's aware of when and what we'll be doing so that uh, there's no cause for concern um, and that everybody's aware of that process so that they can adjust their schedules um, to make it uh, efficient for anybody that needs to you know, the patrons have their, their normal access as much as possible during that time frame. And one of the things I'm looking at in doing that is actually combining two of these closure days into one day, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, but as you pass through there. So just let me step in. For yes, sir. Minute. So the only, the only real conflict that I see, and it may not be a conflict at all, it sure. just kind of jumps out, of, is that uh, February the 15th from 1 to 530 at Coastal Community College. Mm -hmm. uh, that and that's is, interior, is that correct? Yes, that's okay. a, that's, uh, that's that, when they have the MMOR parade absolutely. and KOER parade that evening. Yes, um, but that he's talking. I don't even think it's on the either route, but it could be a problem. But no, that traffic. yeah, because our our transport and and our support stuff would be something that we wouldn't want to be in the way of that parade or anywhere right. near that. Okay. So um, that's something I'll definitely need to revisit with them. Um, and then I have overheads created for each of the different locations for each of the different days. It kind of goes with a detailed overhead of where those locations are and what the support, the, the minimal support would be on site. And then if there is a police closure after those locations, there's a police closure map. Um, again, day five, day six, these are ones that are on the outskirts of the city limits and most of our support and traffic and impact would not be in the downtown area. Um, I really wanted to focus with you guys about those downtown setups as I think some of these other ones are more typical standard and um, being shorter time frames, half a day or a few hours at a time will be in each location so that there will be minimal impact and, and something that will um, be an enjoyable experience and not an extended stay. Um, but as you get towards the middle there, there's a, a support detail which goes over the dates for February 28th through March 8th. And those are some of our heavy downtown days. And, and what Jessica and I have been talking about is essentially creating a, a support area with the 
school on Church Street and the new lot that used to be University of South Alabama lot, and then Delamar Avenue and the parking lot uh, that is in between the housing development there and the Fairhope Community Park. And most of the residents we've been talking to, they all park on this far eastern side to access their apartments. So essentially we would try to leave a good portion of the right bay or, or eastern bay and then we'll take a little bit of the western bay for our trucks, stage a, a couple of our trucks and some of our equipment on Delamar and that would essentially provide us a logistical point to then move out to some of these scenes that follow on the next few pages to um, minimize the amount of equipment and traffic that goes on in those areas and kind of contain where a lot of our equipment would be so that we would be focused in on where these different areas of filming would be uh, for each day. We are looking at filming 10 hour days as opposed to 12 hour days. Typically films will be in 10, uh, 12 hour days. We're going to be working in a 10 hour day schedule um, which will help us meet and get out of the area for rush hour traffic. Um, for, for instance, a lot of these that say 530, uh, typically on it would say 5.30 and we would be wrapping out and leaving for another hour, but actually this 5.30 is tail lights for us, meaning that we would have to be done complete filming and have got all of our equipment back onto the trucks and by that time frame we would essentially just be driving out. Um, so our goal is to try to complete filming by 4.30 and then just be loading and clearing out and then opening up the streets around that time so that we don't impact um, any of the rush hour traffic. Uh, but as you see, so day 13, uh, we're looking at uh, the back alley entrance uh, off of Bancroft and a scene in front of the library where she walks from the library across the street and throws her phone at a, at a vehicle that's parked in front of uh, the Virginia Ham building. That scene would be a few hours on the, or in our second location on day 13 on, on February 28th. Uh, our downtown alley work closure for that same day, essentially what I think we can only clear and control the area of Bancroft there um, for those few hours. And what I would like to do is, is then keep Fairhope Avenue open for traffic most of the time and only close it for intermittent traffic control and then allow patrons and stuff to park on Fairhope Avenue. Um, we'll just basically control Fairhope Avenue while we're taking a, a role or, or, or conducting a, a shot there. Um, but And then on day 14, the February 29th, we would start out, uh, this is a, a little bit different of a day, essentially uh, the Margaret's house, like I said, that would be in Fruit Nut District. We'd be filming there with most of our crew, um, but we have a scene where Mark, the main character, goes and gets several different haircuts over the process of the movie. and. Uh, so what we would need to do on this day is basically we'll take Mark away from the main shooting crew. We'll have him get through makeup for an hour and a half. We'll shoot a 15 minute shot of him with a one haircut. We'll take him back, put him back through makeup and hair again. We'll bring him back, shoot another 15 minute shot. Um, so essentially we'll be having two units. We'll have the one at Fruit and Nut District filming uh, Margaret's house. Um, and then at the same time, we'll be bouncing Mark back and forth uh, through makeup to, to grab a couple of different shots at the barber shop so it shows him through several different looks of a ball cap uh, with, with a mohawk with, a, with all kinds of different you know, funny hairstyles um, and then the third location that day being back in front of the exterior library this time not crossing Fairhope Avenue but staying focused right in front of the library itself so we would need to have control of the parking spaces that are right there in front of the, the library and a drop-off zone nearby uh, but we would be able to leave Fairhope Avenue and Bancroft open with ITC. So essentially we would only hold that for traffic control um, when a shot was being conducted. The rest, the, the, the other 45 minutes to 50 minutes of an hour would be open traffic um, and we would just be obeying normal <coughs> pedestrian and traffic laws in that, in that time frame. Um, and then those are s some of the earlier days in, in in the downtown area, which would be in the, February, the end of February, and then the week of March 4th through the March 8th, which is Wednesday through Sunday. That's our kind of some of our bigger um, scene work, which one 
on locations one and two for day 16, we were talking about uh, uh, a bus stop, which is in our special request area that we'll talk about in here in a little bit. But essentially, we're going to have a bus that will pull up towards the bus stop. And so we would need to control a little bit of morphe and section for the hours of that day in order to conduct that scene. Um, and that closure there after that, uh, which would we've broken out to the detour point so that they could come down Bancroft or come down Johnson. They wouldn't get stuck in the middle of the road and have to turn around. They could come down and come down Church Street if they need to. Essentially, it would be this cross section that we would control for <coughs> that time frame. Uh, essentially needing to keep it clear so that for safety and for the community and for the crew so that no patrons come and then park with inside the shot and then we hold ITC but they're with inside the containment and then they come out of their whatever uh, store that they would be in and then they're they're inside of our filming zone so these would be why we're having to ask for such a large area is because of the scene work um, involving so much on the street with the actors and with the crew um, we just want to make sure that the community and the crew are, are safe during those sections now Jessica I've been working with them to focus on Delamar. Unfortunately, the look and the feel of Delamar didn't offer them some of the things they really liked, obviously, uh, on section of Fairhope, is why they've selected so much of that. Um, but in particular, there's two scenes that I would like to try to combine so that we could do them both on the Sunday, because I know that's one of the, the uh, less active days downtown. Uh, Sunday morning is where we focus one of our scenes. But on day 17, Near the pharmacy, there's a scene where Sean Bean uh, comes up to the stoplight and, and they say hello to him a couple of different times throughout the uh, movie as the, the day repeats. Um, and there's also a scene where they both uh, take a steamroller from that same uh, construction site and pull up next to somebody who's driving a, a car and kind of nod at them in this intersection here at, at Section and Fairhope. Um, and then also on day 18, same area, there's a, a scene where they would like to have them leave from the Fairhope Pharmacy and they walk across the street and down the street in, in kind of a dance, a Fred Astaire dance-like moment where they're talking and also avoiding pedestrians and kind of skirting around cars and moving throughout the streets as if they have totally know where everything is going to be at that moment and then head in towards um, Dr. Music Records um, Wade Shop down on the end. Um, and so this one would be something, again, where the Fairhope and Section Avenue closure would be in place. But this day 18 and day 20 is something I'd like to try to combine with production so that we don't have it on a Friday, so that we would have both of this and our day 20 work on that one Sunday. Um, because right now it's looking like we have a Wednesday, a Thursday, or at least a portion of a Wednesday and a portion of a Thursday, a portion of a Friday, and then a, the morning of, of that Sunday. So I'd like to try to take more of the time there at the Sunday. We'll keep the same closure um, and be able to execute both of those scenes. Uh, day 20 is a big opener scene, uh, reminiscent of kind of the opening of Back to the Future, where um, he goes through the town on a skateboard. This one would be a, the, the main character leaves his house on a bicycle, he helps save a girl's balloon. He throws an egg at a bully who's picking on a little kid. He goes by and uh, helps somebody who's about to fall off a ladder. He ends up helping untuck this lady's sh shirt as she's walking across the street. There's several different moments that he does to try to help people. And he gives somebody directions on the corner of Bancroft and Fairhope before he enters into the library. Um, at the beginning of the movie. So it's a big opening shot and something where they want to kind of try to complete that in one shot if possible, um, which involves a lot of coordination and, and obviously safety for him riding through the, the, uh, the street and, uh, and conducting all those little moments as he passes uh, through that area. And then that closure being one of the largest ones that we have of that area, just because of the amount of area that we would see and traverse in one shot and needed to keep some of that area clear so that we could complete um, complete that take several different times so we have it have it uh, in, in the first half of the day. 
um, and it's 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 like I said, I understand it's a it's a pretty big closure area, uh, but something that I, I I'm going to myself and the the other individuals in my department will be going around shaking uh, meeting hands. I've I've already met with several of the different owners of, of the properties in this area. We're basically going to have a conversation with them, explain to them what days we'll be out there, make sure they all know what the process would be like, um, and uh, and try to give them all, all the information that we have so that they're a part of the process and understand um, and can help us make that a, as uh, successful of a day as possible, um, which 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 I which I done several different areas and in, 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 uh, for several different films. I've actually done about six here in Lower Alabama, two in Birmingham, but I travel uh, up and down the southeast. I've done films in, in South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Alabama, and Louisiana. Um, so the special request page, uh, very quickly, just uh, that yellow box at the top is showing kind of where they would like to place that temporary bus stop there'd be no alterations to the property, essentially a, a moody fabricated bus stop that we would place there for that scene, and then we could remove um, at, upon completion of filming. And then we were also looking at the white uh, wooden waste receptacle containers that are all around the street. Um, they would like to have permission to relocate those whenever we have a shot that would have them in the street, and we'll replace with our own movie uh, waste bins. Um, and that's something that we would would like to do on Fairhope and in section for a couple of different scenes. On the Fred Astaire walk scene from Fairhope Pharmacy to the uh, music store, there are two planners that they would like to relocate so that they can traverse from the street to the sidewalk in that kind of dance moment without having to step over those planners. Um, we'll, like we discussed before, for the downtown support, we're focused on keeping most of our equipment and things on Delamar and at the old school property in the parking lot next door to minimize the movement and, and traversal in between these days, keep them all in one place so that we don't have loud noises or anything going on early in the morning or late at night, um, and that it will keep most of the heavy equipment and bigger equipment away from the downtown streets and really what we'll be dealing with the most is our closures um, for the filming process. And then also requesting barricade and detour assistance um, with the streets department in the event that we are able to do some of these closures. Um, and then another thing that I did not have on here also as well as we were uh, talking about a lease for rental of the warehouse on Pecan uh, Avenue. It's on the agenda today. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's something I, I forgot to include in here, um, that we would be renting that for two months in order for set deck storage um, and prop storage for um, the set decoration elements that we would be using in, in the filming process. Um, and that's the quick overview of a lot of that. There's a whole lot of more information I could go into detail about right now, but I, I don't want to bore you guys with movie stuff when you have more important things to worry about. Um, but I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys may have. So anytime you have a green on the street and you have a cleared street, that's a closed street? Yes, sir, and, 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 and open to what I can talk to production about it. Basically, the, the highlighted green areas would be something where I feel like it will be safer and easier to keep it clear of some of the patrons, and, and, and what we would do is essentially bring in some of our crew vehicles and other cars to make it look like it was a busy area, but it, in order to avoid uh, an, a patron coming in, parking in that area, going to a shop for an hour, and then we close the road for a shot and then they would come out of the store and then be within the, the, the scene or be within that sa that safety zone area. Um, well, some of these are, seem like, you know, I looked at it and I'm looking at day 18 on Friday, March the 6th. You know, you've got a fair portion, all of almost all of the CBD portion of Fairhope Avenue closed from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. you got a lot of Section Street closed from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. And, and then there's some, you know, several examples of that. If you look at day 20, like you pointed out earlier, yeah. there are quite a few streets. Uh, a couple of things. First of all, I'm, I'm very concerned about how the merchants will take the very lengthy uh, street closures. And secondly, we've got a lot of projects going on downtown in which we already have some streets closed. I mean, are people going to be able to drive anywhere downtown if you take you know, the northern end of the town and, and you look at what's already closed. I, I don't know, that work may be wrapped up, but 
you've almost got a situation where you can't even drive through town. I'm concerned with that. Uh, this seems like there's quite a bit of street closures here, quite a bit, um, and they're for very extended periods of time, and they're not just for a couple of hours on the, in, the, in the evening uh, for a parade. They're, they're somebody's entire business day. Absolutely, yeah. And I, you know, I, I really, I, I didn't expect the streets to be closed all day, and I, I, I expected it to be more temporary and then to open them back up. Um, and then I wonder on a lot of these streets where you have a, a lot of parking, does that, does that mean that the street can't be used for, for, for vehicular traffic during those? those times when you have film trucks and staging yes I gotta say I have a lot of concern there is an awful lot of closures for a lot of long time in here absolutely you know? yeah I, I agree it is, is a lot of, of the different areas of closure in, in comparison to what typical films have done here in this area definitely uh, so so to answer your question about the Del Mar Avenue ultimately like I said I would like to try to keep some of those on those lots and what we would have was a minimal things here on on Delamar, but we would be able to leave some of that open. Um, and then in reference to the day 18, the reason why that is so long is because they have attached the Fred Astaire walk to some of the pharmacy day work. And depending on the, where they had that scheduled, I, I we would need to kind of ultimately have that cleared for the daytime from the morning. Um, because it's difficult to clear a street once it's been open to the public. It's right. hard to kind of get everybody out at that point. Um, and that's where I would like to try to get them to, especially because it's a Friday, take the, the, the Fred Astaire dance through Section Street and combine that with the Sunday work so that we would lose our, our closure here on Friday. Um, so it would only be Wednesday and, and Thursday. We're back open on Friday, open on Saturday, and then close the can on Sunday. Sunday um, morning, right? Sunday morning, sure. yes, ma'am. And uh, and what we can do um, before the next city council meeting is we can, m myself and my department, we can go by and talk with every one of these owners on, on the uh, section in Fairhope Street where all of these closures are, basically for every one of these closures, we'll talk about every day of that closure and kind of bring them up to speed and kind of give them a packet. We can even have them kind of do a sign off. Um, what sometimes what we'll do typically is, is go through the whole process with them. Um, I'll probably end up doing some location agreement contracts with them to insure their property, make sure they're liable free for any all activity, um, to make sure that they are protected for that process. Um, there's language in our agreements that make sure that we take care of their property um, as well. Um, it's, it, it, it will be difficult for us to make uh, full compensation for, for certain things that would be going on. But ideally, um, this, uh, this is an early stage for us as far as our planning is concerned. So I'd like to feel like a lot of these times would be consolidated or um, what we were essentially we could shoot out the scenes that would require that closure. And then for instance, move into the bookstore or move into um, the doctor music or move into the pharmacy or move into some of these areas and then once we get inside and are off of the street on that place we can open up traffic and and make it back to a normal traffic and normal access for all the patrons in the area um, and, and there may be ability for us on a lot of these different scenes for us to place uh, businesses or open signs on each side of the sidewalk and allow pedestrians and patrons to come in walking uh, from the sides to access these stores uh, because we'll essentially be looking down one area of section um, for each one of those shots. So it would be open to the public uh, via pedestrian traffic, but something where we would try to avoid having some of the cars in there. And, and at this point, it is a very early preliminary um, plans that I've put, put together and I kind of wanted to put more than we would need so that I didn't come back to you guys later on this the next city council meeting and ask for more than we're asking for at this point. I'd like to come in with the most we would ever need and then reel that back with production over time with your guidance with what you guys uh, believe to be the biggest areas of concern which which are the same things that we've well, been you know I, I, I'm just speaking for myself here but I I know that even on uh, days that we shut down the streets for a few hours for Mardi Gras parades and we get a lot of 
We get a lot of pushback on that, and I believe they have to go get petitions signed by all the businesses on the routes. And I, I mean, if the if the businesses are are okay with it, you know, that that's my only concern. They're okay with it. I'm I'm okay with it. I'm only looking after their interests. But if they have to close their doors almost for, and they'll tell you they may have to close their doors for two or three or four days. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I feel like there needs to be some meetings with merchants and and get their feedback before I'm willing to. There's a lot of street closures on here. There's an awful lot of street closures. Brandon, you touched on it, and you just mentioned it again, just so I understand. When it says cleared streets in the little packet, that means cleared of pedestrian traffic, unless y'all open it up to Correct. Pedestrian. Yes, sir. Yeah. That was my yeah. question too. Is it just traffic? Is car traffic or pedestrian? Most of the, most uh, some of those things would would definitely require pedestrian. Uh, control to come out of those essentially because if we, we allow the pedestrians to come into these different shops and then we start a take of say the bike ride or the dance scene coming down the road and then those pedestrians or patrons come out of that store they would be in the area of filming um, what we can try to do is figure out you know a, a system to work out with with these shop owners to uh, it, it just there's so many different shops that it would be difficult to get the you know to have a, an individual I'm sorry an individual in each one of those stores with a walkie for communication with production to then communicate to them like that they wouldn't be able to exit the store at that particular moment um, but it's a, it's a plan that we could try to figure out too as well if we want to try to leave more pedestrian areas open what I can do is work with production to to pick the areas only the areas that they need to have control for pedestrian and vehicle traffic that way we would be able to allow as much of the business that would go on in that area for that time frame um, without uh, without impacting that but yes sir it's it's a ultimately becomes a a control issue for for the safety and for the community and for the crew as we're driving around or have the equipment or, or have the actor moving through that space um, it it uh, it it there's so many points of entry. Um, that's where, our, our, like, even on some of these closures, we have um, traffic assistance areas where we would try to help make sure that nobody would come out of some of these alleyways or side streets where we wouldn't have a police uh, officer to in order to make sure that we are keeping a safe containment area for that that scene work. Um, and so. It uh, essentially yes. The, at, at this point, those are the are, those areas in green are places that I feel like it would be beneficial for the safety and for the community and for the crew and for the filming process to have some of those areas cleared out. Um, but that's something that I can go back to production and and try to see what other plans we can try to do to make that. Less of a, a, a and that's one reason we wanted him to be here tonight because yeah. no, we wanted to have it. these conversations and he I mean he did something that they've not really done for us before which is put together these shots of what it would look like and what the closures would look like so that we could all have the conversation um, PD has got a copy of this we'll get a copy to Richard as well but that way everybody has an opportunity to, to find their you know where they are we want you to all be on board with it we want to make sure that we're doing the right thing for our citizens and, and for our community um, and I, and I totally understand. I mean, I've, like I said, I've done this in different cities, Tybee Island, uh, in Georgia, we did Baywatch and we had closures of the beach in the middle of the summertime and we had every parking lot of the beach access from the north end of Tybee Island to the south end of Tybee Island. And we had a guy riding a motorcycle up the boardwalk all the way down the pier. Um, and we had to close all of that area down for, for days on end. And so it's, it's obviously not ideal or not something that I would even want to ask to do this much work in the downtown area. Um, but the way the script is and the, what it really features is the downtown environment and the fact that they explore the town and find all these little moments and help all these different people. It's something where that's kind of where they put their focus. And, and, and Jessica and I have been talking to them about Delamar and Church Street and Summit and some of these other areas, and they have looked at some of them. They obviously want to go for the most picturesque and the most beautiful areas and the most, um, the ones that tend to typically be the busiest for business and things that impact. So it's, it's something where I totally understand where this is a, a big endeavor and something that will have more impact that would be in the downtown area than any film that's been here. In, in quite some time, um, but it's something where it would 
help to benefit some of these shops in the long term. Um, we did uh, a lot of closures and things like this for the movie Safe Haven in North Carolina for Southport. Um, and we actually called the town there Southport in the movie. And I think it was a, a year after they had 60 to 55 to 60 percent increase in tourism and, and exploration of their area after that Safe Haven movie had come out. And I've been talking to production Jessica, I've been talking to them. They're considering to call the town in this movie Fairhope, if you guys were uh, open to that. Um, they may, may be called Fairhope, Massachusetts, or Fairhope, just nondescript Fairhope. Um, but, um, no state. Yeah. <laughs> Fairhope, no state. <laughs> <laughs> so th that's something that they were looking into to see if you guys would be interested in, in, in accommodating and allowing them to show off this area as Fairhope. Um, which it, it would ultimately become a, a very long, you know, it'd be a, a heavy process and, and a heavy burden for these businesses, but something that I will take on the, uh, the weight of responsibility to make sure that they're all aware of what we're doing, when we're going to be there, um, and to try to take care of them as much as possible. Um, in some instances, that might be uh, compensating for loss of business. Uh, it, it, uh, it just will, it just has to be something that I have to see with them what their impacts would be um, and, and what we can do to, to make that uh, as, as easy a process for them so that we, we can compensate for what would be the loss if, if, if we do in fact create uh, that, that much of a sus substantial change in their, in their daily traffic. Well, let me ask you to, to hold off from there and we'll hear from the, the council yeah, and yeah, what, what their thoughts are. <clears throat> if you shut down Jewins on a Sunday, we might have riots in the street. <laughs> uh, that's one thing, too, that on that special that's request true. page. That's that true. bus stop is on private property, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. not, that shouldn't involve us. And then three, on the uh, <clears throat> filming permit application, you got the city of Daphne. You might want to change that. Okay. Uh, any other comments? No, I think the idea uh, of, of talking to the merchants to find out exactly what their concerns would be with any potential street shutdowns and getting any, because each person can give you their own independent take on how it might affect their business on that particular day at this particular time of year. But that's really hard for us to gauge, and so uh, that would be my advice, and just kind of let us know what that feedback is. Yeah, I think leaving it open to pedestrians just if you do that, I mean, if you got to have some, you know, some guy on the sidewalk on each end of the street, you know, stopping people while the filming is going on in a certain spot. Yeah, and, and I think the parking garage is better way. Just think that, <laughs> well, no. you know, it depends on what the merchant is. Yeah, yeah. Park up there, it's not ever as close. And, and again, if there is compensation yeah. and how that would work and what. And what. Yeah. what what I was thinking was, if, Jessica, can you, um, can you get with Alex mm -hmm. and and I don't know if you'd have to call a special meeting, but call us, you know, a meeting of the downtown merchants, and that way you, you don't have to go to each one individually necessarily. You could maybe get a lot of them at one time and have a discussion. Well, what do you, that assumes that each one of them that may be impacted and show up at the meeting. No, but I mean, it, it won't. It will never be a hundred percent, but it might be. You know, it it might save twenty five trips. Yeah, but then you have uh, my concern with that is you know each individual may be impacted differently and what their specific circumstances are and they may not want to broadcast that in a meeting with everybody else involved. Yeah, I typically like to give them my business card and my information, then sit down them, with them for thirty minutes or so and talk about the process and see what their concerns are. So in case there is something like I said with jewel rents that they need to try to figure out a way that we can find a place to direct their people to park for that day. And, and put signs up on the backside to show them how to get to Jewel Winds, you know, if, if that's something we can try to help accommodate a, a concern for them on a particular day or scenario. Um, or, for instance, in a residential area, if there's somebody that has a handicap, we, you know, we stay away from that area so that they have their handicap parking. I like to try to investigate to figure out what the um, concerns are for each one of those entities in that area. Obviously, this a whole downtown area being a larger area of, uh, and a lot of different businesses, uh, but something that we will definitely, as a team, spend the time necessary to make sure that we we understand what we're what we're doing and how we're affecting the uh, the business of these places, so that 
we can report back to you guys before this next city council meeting and say the, these are the areas where these are the concerns for for these businesses and this is how we'd like to try to to address some of those concerns that's a lot of work do you think you could come back with some feedback before the next meeting and, and that's a that's a pretty tall task yes but. sir it is um it, and 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 this are this would be a portion of the days of the filming we do have work in daphne and in mobile but it's a, something where uh, Scott Lumpkin being the producer on this movie is from Fairhope and we want to make sure that we do right by Fairhope uh, as best possible and something that I'm probably going to devote uh, two of my assistant managers to spending time there over the next two weeks and myself included to uh, begin the conversations and start to explore what uh, what we're what we would be creating by, by doing this type of activity and we can plan to come back in two weeks for the work session in two weeks with the, the answers to all the questions that you guys have got what else can we do? Any more questions? I think it's my biggest concern, but I think you all got a plan. Yeah. I think you're being very proactive, and, and if you can consolidate that Friday, the 18th, with another day, then that just relieve one day. That just it'll yeah. help your cause. The Friday scares me. I'd, I'd rather not be in the downtown area on a Friday when everybody's trying to get their errands mm -hmm. done and do the things that they normally would do. Um, <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. All right. We've got about five or six more minutes, maybe. Jay, talk about the mullet fountain. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, back in the fall, I was asked by the mayor and Richard Peterson to go look at the mullet fountain. I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know where it was when they asked me. I went and found it. It was in um, disrepair. Uh, we tried to do some things to it. Um, we were unsuccessful. Uh, the the um, director of the museum at the time called the artist to see if she wanted to get reinvolved in it. I brought it to uh, your attention. I piggybacked on the work session meeting and told you we didn't even have the plaque right. Her name's never been right. It is right now, I have the plaque in my office. It's ready to be reset. And um, she wants to be involved with it. She's picked out some tile. I know the tile's very expensive, um, and I understand that. But I will say this, the plan is to uh, reopen. As you see up on there, uh, we want to bring the uh, pavers out to the road. And we believe by bringing the pavers out to the road, currently they just go to the side. Uh, nobody uses the pavers. I think that uh, we'll take out, with Richard Johnson's help, I've spoken to him about this, uh, we'll create a walkway and we'll open up uh, the path directly to the museum so people have a better uh, view of it. In the summer, when you have the most of the foot traffic, you can't see a lot because all that is green and it's overgrown. So, um, you know, we we're gonna have a rededication and everything. I don't, you know, I think it's a worthwhile endeavor if, if you agree. Uh, I think it'll bring more foot traffic into the museum and certainly, um, you know, this is our artistic community. So that's why we brought it to your attention. We looked at different uh, ways to uh, pay for this and I, and I uh, acquiesced to Ms. Creech as she said that it has to have a home first from an asset standpoint. That's correct, right? But, uh, if, you know, there's not a lot that I'm capable of doing, we're gonna to have to uh, hire it out one way or the other. So, uh, and I do know that the tile is expensive, but I do also know that I think there's a benefit, if you agree, um, long term. Uh, I think that a lot of artists will look at how we treated this, and we have not treated it very well in the past. Um, and I think that it may, you know, energize some people to get reinvolved or maybe even donate some more artwork. I know this is a commission. I know that we paid for most of this or pay for a great deal of it. So I'm gonna ask you guys, we, it's, we don't have to decide tonight uh, at all, but just to think about what you wanna go and how you wanna go forward with it. Well, I think we need a little more information. I mean, for instance, you're saying that, that the artist recommends new tiles and, and at council what happened apparently, uh, you know, uh, it was a saltwater fountain. Uh, right. It was uh, chlorine was placed into the fountain HTH, it's, a, it's really a strong 
chemical. But anyway, yeah. yes, uh, that's chemicals correct. were placed in there that uh, I guess it fouled up not only the pump, but it, but so that's the, some, one of the, some of the questions. I have. Are, are the tiles are, are there tiles there now? And were they no, there are pebbles. Is, it, is, is that is that even? I'm hearing new tiles, but is it replacing tiles that were ruined, or is this just kind of reinventing the the fountain now? I mean, did it did I it color the, the copper? I mean, it did it, a, it did a lot of things. Can the copper uh, be reconditioned? I don't think the copper needs to be reconditioned. The outside, uh, it we didn't realize it, uh, but the outside got seams. The cracks were in the seams. It was leaching out of that. Uh, we've replaced the. Uh, we repaired those uh, in house. We have a really good welder, Ray Mina, who repaired those in house. Uh, the main thing is, is the tile uh, would go around where the pebbles you see now, because the pebbles are falling off, and the pebbles are going into the pump and, and causing the pump. Uh, to be uh, jammed up. Now we got all the rocks out now, but they're going to continue to fall off. So either way, the rocks have to come off, and it'll be that strip around the top. Uh, again, the only thing I want is how do you want us to go forward with this? What 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 foot do we want to set forward with this? The tile was recommended as a replacement for the rock strip that's around there, the pebble strip that's around there. They'll take that off and they'll put the tile around that strip if that's what you would like. Now, the tile, I realize, is extremely expensive. Yeah, well, put a number on that. What's that? $14,000. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot. But it's going to be hand laid and it's going to look like mullets and stuff. Listen, I, I get, you know, when she hit me up with this, I, I was the same way you are. And, and I just, and wanted to know how you want to proceed. I only have five minutes. That's I'm okay. Well, what are the other <laughs> options? Though? I think, well, we don't, we don't well, have there's, there's any option. We own it. The, 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 we don't even have to fix it if you don't. I'm, no, I'm not well, trying we to make it. Uh, I've heard, you know, an option to, to convert it over to chlorine <laughs> because all the other pumps use chlorinated water, but it costs more. Could you leave it as salt water and just tell, uh, and for, for, the, for the record, it was not Public Works or any of Jay's. It wasn't Water Department. No. Nobody, nobody did that. Mm. Uh, but can they be told, all right, if we keep it salt water, uh, we can that, you know, refurbish it? I mean, what, the, what's, the, pump, the, what's the, the best alternative for it? Right, the, the pump, the pump is, a, is just a minor cost. And, yeah. and, and I handle, my department handles all the heavy maintenance on all these anyway. I can absorb that. That's not an issue. But if we go about, to salt water. I'm asking from a standpoint of, you know, do you, what kind of water do you want going into that fountain? She wanted salt. That copper, she it wanted should be salt. salt water. Right, okay. it should be salt. Right. But here, uh, uh, we can handle that end of it. That's not a big issue. The is the only big issue. issue then the tile? Is that the big right. sticking point? Yeah, and, and some of the work to go with it. So, I mean, the whole cost is, I don't know how much we can do ourselves. I can't lay the tile, um, but the $14,000 to start with, and then there may be some associated cost um, with laying the tile. And then we, there's, some that we, there's some things we can do in-house. When, you know, as far as the repair goes, my electrician that I have in my department can fix the lights. We can replace the lights. We're not looking at labor, you know, any labor costs in where, that. Where is the towel? Just around the, the water line? Uh, the yes. Pool, mm -hmm. the yeah, line. if you ever, if you go over there, I'm sorry I didn't take a picture of it, I didn't think, but it's about a, a foot or maybe more all the way around the inside edge at the top, right at the top of the water line. But you can see, if you ever look at it, the rocks are falling out now. Does it have to be there? I think we'd have to ask the artist. I mean, I, but, I'm not. I, you know, that's I, that's why you know I'm I'm not hesitant to be up here. But I, the artist was asked to be involved, and that's what she's asked to do. And that's what I'm presenting to you is what she's asked to do. Uh, to be, a, you know, I don't know if it's a just a drop dead deal. She's not going to be involved anymore if we don't allow her to put this tile in. The tile was what she wanted. The tile is what she presented to me, and I'm presenting to you. So if we didn't go with new tile, the expenses to get the fountain up and run again would be pretty nominal? Well, that part would have to be fixed one way or the other. Right. Whether we went back with the, the expensive tile or inexpensive tile, yes, I would say it's not a ton of money. Or rock or something. Uh, I don't think it's removable, uh, Councilman Burrell. Uh, I okay. think that there's a, I think there's a thing. Okay, that, something that has to be put there. Okay, yeah. that's helpful. Something, ha I mean, uh, you can't just remove the tile and have no tile. No, because there's a mesh back there that the rock was on. So you had to get that down, and it's not part of the, uh, it's not part of the bowl of the So of there's the some, some certain amount of work that has right. to be done, regardless of whether right. you go with tile right. or whatever. Right. Okay. Right. That's helpful. Then you start splitting hairs over whether you go with tile or something else, and then they always yeah, recommend I don't that. want to, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to be the one who picks the, 
tile. So somebody, if we don't go with that tile, we'll have to find somebody who, who okay. maybe the artist will come yeah, back well, and I say, okay. the artist too. I know, I know the artist, uh, as far, I mean, at least I know who did it. Um, you know, and so what I was saying about splitting hairs, if you got to do something, you start getting to, you know, 10,000 or 14,000, that's what I was saying, you're splitting right. hairs, you might, might just behoove you to go with the artist's recommendation, because at that point you're only, you know, maybe a few thousand dollars different one way or the other. Right. Right. That, that's a metal pot it's sitting in, right, the sculpture? Right. So, I mean, you could theoretically take the tile and the mesh and take it back down to the metal bowl. Uh, I think... That she told me that the bowl, no, I, I want to be clear about that. I think it's just a shell that they set this thing, this, um, this like gunak pool, for instance, inside that shell and then built the shell over the top of it. So I think that the outside is just a shell. It doesn't hold water, but the water has leached out uh, where the pebbles were and damaged the bowl. The bowl is a shell gotcha. and it was assembled in place. But we can fix that. We can We've fix already that. fixed the shell. Right. Right. But the inside of that bowl is like a swimming pool. It's a goodnight finish. Right. I think I think there was actually a concrete um, cast that was set in there, and then yeah. it's kind of back to uh, when I was at the uh, museum's um, uh, advisory committee meeting last week. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, some of this came up, and I actually, and I've just been too busy. I wanted to call Robert. He's in construction business to go take a look at that and I haven't I, done it yet. And I it can probably help us to maybe take a look at it. Um, you want to call me? I can meet you guys over there if that's what you want to do just to look at it. I don't I think know. So. I think it might help make a better informed decision. Do you want to meet with her too or not? Sure. I don't All right. Mind. All right. Sure. Just let uh, me know. I'll try to set everything up. The try. biggest question I guess is, is if it's got to have something, why does it have to have that particular one as opposed to another one? It's the one she selected. Right. I mean other than the fact that that's what she would like to have. Right. I don't. They, listen, I don't think that there's a. I don't think there's a technical aspect to it. If that's what you're asking. Kind of what I'm asking. Yeah. No, I don't think there's well, a technical aspect. I think it's just an artistic yeah, standpoint. But it keeps a little of the originality. You know, right. I believe. I think, I think that's, that's what what something to be said for that too. Okay. Well, kind of get down like a kid. Do you need it or do you want? Yeah. On what I'm going to spend. Is there anything else? Any comments on that? This thing to help for for one or two y'all to at least go lay eyes on it and. And see what you think. Good. I'll take a look at it and formulate an opinion. And, yeah. and uh, I might at least just send y'all some thoughts and maybe get back and I don't know and if, if we need to move on it. Because it's not, like I said, it's not on tonight's agenda. I don't no, wanna, it's not. I don't want to uh, to lay things, asking, but we could, we could potentially get something to put together before the next meeting. So uh, if you want to call me uh, tomorrow or something, we sure. can set up a, a time and sure. to go. Uh, Robert and I can maybe get together and see what's good for us. I, I'm pretty open this week to go. All right. Yeah. Anything else? No. Thanks, Jay. Thank no, you. Appreciate it. Uh, before we get to committee updates, I want to get to some department head updates, and in particular, um, to save some time in tonight's council meeting, I want to ask uh, Chief Ellis to make uh, fire department comments, real quick. Yes, sir. Oh, thank you. I'd like to introduce. We had our elections. Why don't you come up here for the sake of? Uh, All right. The people that might be watching from home. Thank you, Council President, Mayor. Uh, <coughs> we had our uh, annual elections last week, and I'd like to introduce you all to our uh, 2020 Board of Directors. I would, I'm the Fire Chief again for this year. Uh, in the back, we have David Thomas. He's our Assistant Chief. Uh, Dalton Combs is our assistant chief. Uh, Rick Stuarty is our, our secretary. And uh, Mark Pellucci is our treasurer again for this year. So that's our board of directors for 2020. And for our calendar year 2019, we ran 1,023 calls, which is a third year in a row we've broken 1,000. Just a quick update. Well, thank you, Chief. Thank you. Congratulations to all the, to you. Thank you. And to all the new board members. Appreciate what you thank do. You. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to back up now. I want to make sure that we got that in before we ran out of time. I want to back up to committee <coughs> updates and uh, start with you, Jay. Do you have any committee updates? Not this year. Okay. Jimmy? Uh, the only update I have is the Historic Preservation Committee is. Um, working on an update to the proposed ordinance about forming a historic preservation commission 
they're going to be on the work session. I think the last council meeting in February to okay. just discuss okay. pros and cons with y'all. All right, Robert. Uh, the head bike committee did not meet uh, this month. The new Fairhope Public School Commission met last week and elected the chairman, Ken Cole. Uh, vice chairman is Kerry McLemore and secretary is uh, Miranda Shrubby. So the officers were elected. We discussed uh, what the roles of the commission is. That was it. Thank you. Kevin? Actually, we had a harbor board meeting, but I was out of town. You were kind enough to step in my place so, and let you have it. Okay. Well, I'll give a quick update on the harbor board meeting. Uh, uh, we did have a, a quorum there, and uh, there were plans uh, that have been drawn, some renderings uh, of, <coughs> of a vision for the uh, Fairhope Docks Marina. And uh, I believe it was very well received by you know, all the members of, in attendance at the Harbor Board. Uh, and uh, I, won't, I don't want to, uh, you know, uh, steal all the thunder from Lynn. We'll, we'll be unveiling that. I think maybe, are you, are you going to present that at the State of the City? Um, maybe? We certainly can. We'll be introducing the rest of the council then to it on okay. Wednesday. We haven't okay. seen it yet. Right. So right. we can have it ready for just kind of a master plan or vision for uh, for that for that area and just how to uh, you know, control the traffic through there uh, and uh, it has a what would you call it what you call it a poor man's yacht club poor man's yacht, man's yacht club is just a, a sitting area and just uh, maybe a terrace there by the uh, existing uh, boat shed and it does include um, uh, some plans for um, about a boat storage for about is it 55 50 or 55 boats roughly i think 55 boats on that site so i think that she'll be presenting that to all of you council members uh, in the coming week or weeks uh, i don't have any other committee reports so we'll move to uh, department head reports i kind of want to go through this quick because we, we might want to hit on a few things on tonight's agenda before we get to it uh jessica do you have anything else okay tim no Okay. All right, Buford, other than the items of obvious items we have on tonight's agenda. Yes, sir. Uh, Hunter may uh, have some. Okay. Terry? No, sir. Okay, Lynn? No. Yeah. Oh, I see everybody's filling up in here. Uh, Richard? There you go. Richard's standing up. Just two very quick updates since it already got a little bit of press earlier in your meeting. Uh, as you know, the Section Street crosswalks have gone under construction. Um, we are very conscientious of the events and calendars that are coming up. Just so you know, the, the drop dead date for absolute completion is Valentine's Day, which is February 14th, and we all know what happens on February 15th, our first two Mardi Gras parades. Uh, the good news is the actual building of the crosswalks probably should be completed this month with weather participating. TAPCO, who's a subcontractor who's bringing in the actual control systems and the LEDs and all that. Everything is on, has been delivered. They will be here the first week in February to put that system in and get it up and running. So hopefully we will beat that deadline by a week. Uh, also, just a, a very important to us in the city, and I think it's very important to you all as well, um, I, I've had the honor of serving with Mr. Allison and Ms. Creech and Mr. Cortinas as an interview team for our safety coordinator position, which you funded in this year's budget. Uh, I will tell you, we had the opportunity to interview six outstanding candidates. I think that we have at least arrived at a top two consistent cons, uh, consensus. They're, they're very close there. Uh, we're going to be uh, sitting down with the mayor, hopefully in the next day or two, to, to give our recommendation and move forward there. So we're excited about that. And that's kind of a big step move uh, forward in, in a safety program for our city. So those are the two things I want to share with you. Okay. And we are we are doing our best to keep everybody informed about when the closings are uh, and when it's not going to be back open at night. And and our PD has been just so wonderful to work with us, and and, and we've kept them up to date as well. And uh, but when there is going to be some concrete work, there may be a closing where it doesn't open up back that night because that concrete has to cure for the recommended amount of time. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Here you go. Chief, do you have anything? Okay. <coughs> Jay, anything else? No. Okay. Hunter? Uh, we, I'm going to 
stay here unless you have questions. The 22nd at 2 p.m., the planning commission is going to have a work session for the Window Road overlay. Um, anyways, welcome. Here we are going to have that more of a roundtable discussion at the Nick Center. We finalized that location today, and we'll be sending out our advertisements tomorrow. What time is that going to be? 2 p.m. And we're going to, that was during the day because we did get some complaints on, we're always meeting at night, so the planning commission next month will also be kind of a rehash of the same conversation, so we can maybe get two groups. Okay. Right. Mike? Uh, the only thing I remember really quickly from the electric department is the big power transformer for Twin Beach that had failed its initial oh, well, the first testing. Um, they rebuilt it and it did pass. It will be here in the middle of the month. Okay. All right. Thank you. Eric? No, sir. Ben, oh wait, you don't know staff. <laughs> Marcus? Oh, I didn't see you. Okay, yeah, Pat, I didn't see you there. All I really have is the pickleball courts are near completion. We just need final walkthrough to open them up for play. I take it you're a pickleball player that you, since you were up to speed on all that? No, uh, there's some, Pat, Pat's done some good, a good job identifying some stuff with soccer, trying to get soccer in line with what the other rec leagues are doing. And uh, there, there's some of the field usage issues that, that they're ironing out. But I didn't know if you were going to talk about that night or you got something handled. I haven't played on it, but I can. I, it, I don't know. There were some people that may have, or were coming tonight or may have come tonight. I don't know if they are. Soccer league is being run a little different than what rec football, rec basketball, or rec baseball are. They are paid coaches. They are paid administrative staff with soccer. There's no franchise fees. There's no business licenses with these folks. And so I think Pat's done a good job right now of identifying what's going on and trying to corral that with you giving them franchise agreements, is that right, or going to? We talked about this just yesterday, mm -hmm. that four. So uh, I think Pat's doing real good trying to get a handle on what's going on out there. And it's it's also an issue with regard to field usage. There's some teams that have been cut out from using the fields. Uh, they've only got three of the nine fields right now that are for rec and for intramural. The rest of them are being used for these pay academies and whatnot. That, um, and they're out there excluding other teams that want to come in and use the facilities. Now, again, I said, I think Pat's, Pat's got a handle on it, working at it, but uh, we're working on everything just to let you know what's going on. You straightening all that out, Pat? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, I would remind, I think we had, you know, we had brought this up a couple of months ago, at least, about the franchise fees, and, and that has to come to council for approval. If somebody's using, uh, you know, any of the rec facilities to, to coach or for profit or for any of that, so. I was going to give an update on that too. Just it just needs to be added to the work section. You want to do it now? Um, we don't do have now? everything. Uh, I think that was that was our last that was our last uh, department head. No, I know. We just list us on the work session, and we'll give an update on everything. So. Oh, okay. All right. Very good. Um, anybody have anything else for the work session? We're well past it. We'll move on to the agenda meeting real quick. The five will be a public hearing. Uh, six, if anybody has any questions about that. Uh, Lise, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have about that. Um, uh, Jessica uh, will be on hand to ask, uh, answer any questions about the Pecan Avenue property uh, lease. Um, in number eight, uh, I know that uh, Tim has been working um, with the Mediacom agreement, and I know that the new, um, uh, how would I say it, the, um, consultant. the consultant that's, you know, helping with the, uh, well, whether it be Mediacom or the cell towers or whatever, has, has been looking over that and providing a lot of, a lot of good input on that. Uh, the Fairhope Film Ordinance, uh, once again, uh, Jessica. Jessica, to save some time for uh, in tonight's council meeting, will you come forth and uh, kind of highlight the changes uh, to the film ordinance? Sure. And you should have it in your, if you have a book, you should be in there. Oh, it's just mine? There's a highlighted. Yeah. So our film changes are they're pretty uh, 
pretty simple. We, we made sure that we added language um, in the practice of conducting business for commercial purposes or commercial entity for filming in the section one. Uh, we also are, we're also changing the time and what time, uh, when the application should be to us. So well, yeah, and let me, let me back up on that. Just, sure. And the reason I, you know, that Jessica changed that is that, you know, if somebody's out there, the, the way it was worded, it said all filming. So mm -hmm. technically you'd have to get a permit if you were out there videoing your kids on the sidewalks. Obviously that's absurd. So it means now that it takes it down to more if you're out there filming mm -hmm. for commercial purposes. Um, so if you're using city property, we're asking the application be received no later than 21 days ahead of time. That gives us the option to get it onto the council agenda. That's something that you guys have to look at. Um, if you're not using city property, we're asking that it be received no later than 14 days ahead of time. You'll see in that ordinance uh, that we're adding in certain cases, exceptions to the application deadline can be made at the direction or discretion of community affairs director and the mayor. Um, Jack suggested that we add that. I do think it would give us a little bit of leeway. Uh, we also have included, um, you'll see that, that language multiple different, multiple times throughout. Um, but prior to the granting of any filming permits, the one-time application fee. So for low impact films and commercials that are less than 15 minutes in length, we're asking for an application fee of $500. That's down from the $1,000 that we've typically asked for. Uh, and a $2,500 security deposit, which again cuts that security deposit in half for those smaller productions. For uh, high impact films or commercials that are greater than 15 minutes in length, that continues to be that one-time application fee of $1,000 and the $5,000 security deposit. Um, we want to make sure we just added a little bit of about refundable deposit and we've added some some changes uh, or we just clarified some language in there but we made sure that we said that all production companies commercial entities or companies filming for a commercial purpose must obtain a city affair at business licensing bef license before filming can commence this is something we've always asked for but we're making sure that we spell that out in the ordinance now so that there's no question and, and kind of you know spells it out for us. One other thing is exemptions. Um, we added one more line to the exemptions section, that's section 10, um, and that is that local news organizations that routinely report on news and events concerning the city of Fairhope are exempt, provided that the production is low impact. Uh, because again, our language before said everybody should obtain a filming permit and we wanted to make sure that we were allowing that business to, to continue. Any questions? It says a permit access required for any film. Is that news companies or anybody? I'm sorry. Yeah, that's one of the exemptions. On section 10. Right here. This is oh, I don't have. One. I know. No, I've, I've got it. This little mm -hmm. bridge so in 10, it would show that they are exempt. No problem. Because obviously they come over and film a 20-second, yeah. you know, 30-second second segment. Sure. They're not. They're not. A, you know, putting together a feature film, and they do it routinely. Uh, and we also. Um, well, basically, it's the same thing we discussed. It is Prime absolutely meeting. pretty much everything we yeah, discussed. No problem. Yeah, no, we just no, got it in that words. Was all okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All good. Okay. okay. Thank good. you. Thank you. All right, uh, ten. Uh, if we had a question about the gov deals, uh, who would we ask? Is Richard. Uh, Richard. Okay. Um, the street drainage improvements on item 11, if anybody has any questions about that. Richard. It'll be you, Richard. Okay. Richard, would that be you, 12 as well? Oh, Michael, okay, I see you back there, Michael. And 13, obviously. Michael, that you, 13? 14. And 14 as well. Okay, and all these, uh, and these are mostly all budgeted items, so we have Pat there, but um, I think these were all discussed in the budget. Uh, if there, are there any of these, has anybody looked at items real quick? If you could, 15 through, 15 through 20, I'm sorry, 15 through 21. Are there any of those that are not budgeted items? 
They are all budgeted items. Yes. Okay. Uh, item 22, St. Joseph's Way. Richard. That's Richard. I think that's just standard operating procedure. Uh, item 23, um, is that going to be Lynn? Is that going to be you? Jeff will be here. Jeff will be here, okay. All right, um, item 24. And I can handle that if I need to. I can handle 25. Um, let's see, I think uh, it might be, if you have questions about 26, you might direct them to Jay. And 27 is pretty standard. We'll ask the chief that. <coughs> Any questions? Okay, if not, we'll go ahead and adjourn and... Uh